So let's start with some just kind of some basics. So it doesn't have to be all these really you know big words, polysyllabic words. Sometimes even in your descriptives, uh, and I just kind of cut and pasted here from an Excel spreadsheet, actually from a pivot table. So I have uh, average, um, a mean and standard deviation on blood pressures, and then a count on blood pressures. I kind of use a you know, I'm a public health guy, so I have a, a data set of a, it's kind of a concocted uh, data set of uh, kind of, you know, some, some continuous variables like blood pressures and then some discrete variables like location and gender and so forth. So I kind of use that as an example. So in this example, so we have the blood pressures um, and then we have it by gender and then you can also do it by region. And you can, in a, in a pivot table, you can flip those around so you can do region by gender and all that stuff. But that's an example, pretty simple, but where you can actually blow out and expand uh, the types of descriptives um, that you're using. Uh, the same is true even in graphs. So kind of the same thing, kind of from the same data set where you know, I have um, you know, just numbers in a, in a study and I have it by gender and then by region. So again, you can do kind of, you know, simple, but also kind of meaningful because sometimes the graph or the pivot table will show you, wow, I have, you know, more females in the Midwest uh, and so forth. I think we're back. Yeah, we're back. Wow, I don't know what I did. Okay, so the next thing to talk about are the, um, the intervening variables. So again, you know, these aren't Overly complicated things, uh, but things you need to know about. So, but uh, you know, something like a confounder that literally can confound and you know cause cause some issues in your analysis. You may have effect modifiers, um, and that you may have you know main effects and interactions, which can actually be kind of cool. So, what is a confounder? So, confounding is the distortion of the effect of a risk factor or an outcome. So, in this example. Uh, we're looking at the association between obesity and, cardi and uh, cardiovascular disease, okay? And um, I saw in the intro, some of you are public health people, so you know you, you understand what an odds ratio is. So here we have a relative risk. In this case, it looks like it's a relative risk. We have a relative risk of 1.78. Uh, so you're, you, know, you have increased chance of having um, cardiovascular disease if you're uh, obese compared to non-obese. Okay, so then here's just an example. So what about age? Is age a confounder in this relationship? Okay, can, um, you know, if you, if you break this out then for um, people under age 50 compared to people over age 50, now if you recalculate your relative risk, you can see that they actually dropped. So they went from 1.78 down to 1.4. 4.3 and 1.44, depending on the on the age. So then the question is: Is age a confounder? Uh, and again, there's you know some chapters and textbooks that describe this. But basically, if it's changing your analysis, so if it went from a statistically significant relationship to a non-significant relationship, or if it changed the direction of the relationship, it went from a positive to a negative. Those are examples uh, of a confounder. If it, if it goes from a statistically significant finding to still significant, but the numbers have changed, then you might not actually consider it a confounder. I just had a question about the formulas on the, on the last slide, the earlier slide with the confounder. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is that too much to, to talk about the bottom, like what the RR and the, or can we do that if we have some time at the end? Yeah, let's do that at the end. Those are, um, so there are, this is just a two by two table of, um, there's relative risk and odds ratios. So what it's saying, and it's just, it's, it's uh, literally, you know, um, let me see on the earlier table. Do you see how it actually does the math here? Okay, so you take the, the 46, the 300 divided by the 60 into the 700. You do the math and it comes out to a 1.78 odds ratio. So basically, um, you know, the, and it's, you know, compare, so it's the, um, yeah, so 
So the people who are obese, even though there are fewer numbers, there were fewer in the population. So their rate, their rate of, of heart disease, it was 0.153 compared to 0.086. And so that's, a, that's called a relative risk. So that's what the RR, is that the relative then, risk? That's the relative risk. Yep. Okay, great. And, Thanks. And there's a different calculation. There's another one called the odds ratio. It's using the same numbers, and it's just looking at, and actually we get to odds ratios um, in some of the multivariate statistics as well. So it's good to know what those, those are. Okay, so here's another example. We have covariates. So a covariate is a measure of how changes in one variable are associated with changes in a second variable. And it, you, know, you can think of a lot of examples of covariance. You know, so the degree to which you know, two variables are linear related. So a good example, again, from my world in, in public health and in heart disease, you may be familiar with the Framingham Heart Study. So this is a study where you measure certain variables and it'll predict your 10-year risk of having uh, heart disease. And the, the variables are age, gender, systolic blood pressure, total cholesterol, and HDL. So you may be wondering, why the heck are you not measuring everything else? Why aren't you measuring nutrition and physical activity and stress and all those things? Obviously, they're important, and there's no doubt that they are. But what the, what the analysis does is a lot of these variables are co-related. A lot of the number in one variable is, is actually explained by the other variable, and so you actually don't have to add those other variables. They don't actually, like, if, for example, if you added obesity to the Framingham calculation, it wouldn't increase the sensitivity of the of the risk calculation because obesity is kind of factored into um, systolic blood pressure, total cholesterol, and HDL. I don't know if that makes sense, um, but that's you know you know there's there's probably a whole another lecture just on on that topic as well. But that's an example of a covariate. You can also have a thing called a effect modification. So it's it's a different relationship between the risk factor of an outcome and another variable. So basically, if you know, you may have two variables. So we have, you know, a, in this case, a drug study, and we're looking at. Um, I believe this is looking at, you know, probably. Uh, I'm looking sideways. HDL uh, cholesterol. But as you can see, when they broke it down by gender, there's a difference between men and women in how they how they responded to the drug. So that would be, and actually, um, you know, there's quite a bit of a difference there. So again, that's an example where the one variable, it's not confounding the relationship, it's actually adding to it or almost becoming like a multiplier of, of the relationship. Another example, we have main effects and we have interactions. So the main effect is really the effect of the independent variable on the dependent variable. And that can be done with, you know, with your univariate statistics. Um, but what you may find is you also may have what are called interactions, where the you know the variable changes depending on what's happening to the other variable. Or again, there could be a third variable creating that interaction. So here's an example: variable A and B, you know, with um, and variable one and two, and there's a main effect. So B is greater greater than A. And again, there may be, you know, a reason for that, you know, for further study, but that would be an example of a main effect. Here's an example kind of like what we showed in the earlier graph of an interaction, where it's only, really the effect is only happening in, on one side for one variable and not on the other variable. So that's, that's called a main effect, or that's called an interaction. Sometimes the interactions may cross, so it actually goes one direction for, you know, one form of the variable, so maybe gender in this case. And it goes the other direction for the other type of variable. And here's another example. So this is an example of both a main effect and an interaction. So I don't know if you can see my cursor. Not real easy to do on Adobe here. But you can see that there is a main effect throughout the course of this graph. Um, and so, you know, in this case, this is a fictitious data. I don't even have variables here. But you can see that there's a, there's a difference between the blue line and the green line. But we have three data points and you can see that the difference is actually quite a bit bigger with variable C than it was with A and B. So that would be an example of both a main effect and an interaction. And then of course you can have control variables. So sometimes to reduce confounding you actually control for a variable. So you hold it constant, you know, so everybody in the study, you know, may, maybe it's only only one variable or you, you're throwing that variable out or you're making sure that you, you know what that variable is doing. 
So there's a lot of examples, again, of, of control variables. These are all important things. They're important in univariate, but also can be very important in multivariate statistics as well, just to try to figure out what the heck is going on. If you found that, for example, gender is a confounder, then maybe you'd do the study you know, in only the, you know, only the males or only the females, you know, and then you'd, you know, you'd study the other population.